ready to begin. I'm just going to let people get their seats here real quick. Awesome. All right. Welcome to Talk 20 MHK. Talk 20 MHK is a collaborative project of UFM Community Learning Center and Manhattan Public Library, focused on building strong community connections by giving individuals a platform to share their knowledge, stories, and skills with others in the community. My name is Carmen Schober, and I'm going to be your master of ceremonies for the evening. Maybe some of you, if you attended last year, maybe you remember me. I was one of the presenters um, at the last Talk 20 MHK. I talked about uh, film and goal setting in Rocky Balboa. Don't know? Maybe? Anybody? And I was very pregnant, so <laughs> that may be what you remember. Not anymore. Um, I am excited to announce, uh, to be the master of ceremonies for this Talk 20 and let you know that we have a very, very dynamic, fascinating panel of speakers for you this evening. This event would not be possible without the five presenters you will hear from tonight. We sincerely appreciate each of them stepping up and responding to the call for presenters, fearlessly coming along with UFM and the Manhattan Public Library for the journey that is Talk 20 MHK. Each presenter is sharing a piece of themselves with you tonight, their passion, their hobby, their project, their experience. We also want to thank each of you for coming here tonight and taking the time to attend. Thank you also to those tuning in to the live stream. So many people have asked, what is Talk 20 MHK? Technically, it is five presenters talking for 20 seconds each on 20 slides about their given topic, no exceptions. It's a lot harder than you might think, and it probably sounds really hard anyways. Um, topics have ranged from paddling the Kansas waterways to sword fighting. If you or someone you know would be a great Talk 20 presenter, you are in luck. The next event will be held on March 28th, 2019, and the invitation for presentation proposals is now open at talk20mhk.org. And I'll repeat that info again at the end in case, you know, the mood strikes and you want to do a presentation. We are live streaming tonight's event on YouTube via the Talk 20 MHK channel. Video of the presentations tonight will be available on the website. Okay. Oh, <laughs> uh, there will be time for questions at the end of all the presentations, so please hold your questions until the very end. There will also be snacks and drinks at the end of the evening, graciously provided by friends of the Manhattan Public Library. We encourage you to stick around and to ask additional questions and to make connections. We're almost ready to begin. Just a few more quick housekeeping things. We do have hearing devices available. Please let library staff know if you would like one. Restrooms are located in the atrium. As always, please turn your cell phones off. Please give your undivided attention to each presenter and show your appreciation for them with applause at the end of their presentation. Write down your questions for each presenter as there will be a time for questions at the end of all presentations. And lastly, we will conclude by 8.30 p.m. And the, because the library closes at 9, so they will kick us out at 9. And then one last unfortunate announcement is we were actually scheduled to have six presenters, but one of our presenters, Lauren, was not able to attend tonight because of emergency circumstances. So hopefully we could hear from Lauren maybe at the next one. All right, so thank you again for attending this evening, and we will begin our presentations now. And forgive me, I'm probably supposed to do something, <laughs> right? <laughs> Oops. I thought I was all prepared. Let's get out of this one. Ah, okay. And then find our mouse. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. All right. Our first speaker is Dave Colburn. Oh, good. Okay. Dave Colburn is a native Kansan who has lived in Manhattan for 42 years. He raised three daughters here, the youngest of whom is attending K-State. He is in his 40th year at the Pathfinder and his 16th year of serving on the Manhattan Ogden Board of Education. Dave has been riding bikes since he was six years old. He has raced, done loaded touring, and has at least dabbled in most of the bicycle disciplines. The highest number of miles Dave rode in one year was more than 8,000 miles. Most years, he averages about 4,000 miles of riding. Please welcome Dave.
thank you. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate the invitation to speak. Um, I will admit to being a little bit nervous. I do a lot of public speaking, but I've not done much where it's so intertwined with technology. So I'm a little, little nervous, but uh, we'll give it a go here. So I'm ready to go, whoever I'm nodding to. <laughs> Let's start by talking about riding bicycles within the city of Manhattan. By far the best and most used cycling facility in town is the Linear Park. Stretching nine miles end to end, the trail starts at Casement Road on the east end or at the intersection of Anderson and Reith on the west end. One can also use the sidewalk along Anderson to connect the Linear Park to the trails around Annenberg Park and on to Scenic Drive. Cycling to work or school, or seen here at the Farmer's Market, is quite doable in Manhattan. Using a combination of bike boulevards, bike lanes, multi-use paths, and quiet streets, a bike can definitely be used as a primary form of transportation. The city of Manhattan produces bike maps to help riders find ways around town. My favorite way to use my bike in town is to pedal myself to one of our many fine locally owned coffee shops. Nothing beats a nice bike ride with a stop in the middle for a fine cup of Ethiopian and perhaps a pastry. With a little luck, I will bump into a friend or two at the bistro, which is just icing on the cake. Now let's talk about pavement riding in the countryside, generally referred to as road riding. I'm a road rider at heart, as are many of the other cyclists here in Manhattan. We like to get, a, get out for one or more hours at a time. The most popular ride is the Wamigo Loop. On Saturday mornings, there can be as many as 30 riders using that route to Wamigo for the breakfast ride, which includes a stop at the Friendship, Friendship House refueling. Some of us roadies are so addicted to our riding that we ride all through the winter. This photo is of our January ride or New Year's Day ride in January when the temperature was barely above zero. To organize a ride such as this, the local road riders use a Facebook page called Bike MHK Group Rides. Feel free to join that page and follow along with us. In and around the area, there are organized bike tours like Thrive in the Heat, pictured here. Most organized rides have a 15 or so mile option, a 20 or 25 mile option, and usually a 65 mile option known as a metric century. Some will even offer a full century, a 100 mile route. In bigger cities, there are rides which attract hundreds, even thousands of riders. Kansas City just had their Bike MS ride last weekend. The most attended ride between the coasts is the Hotter Than Hell 100 in Wichita Falls, Texas. Pictured here are myself and Steve Seroff. At the end of the 2015 ride, there were over 11,000 riders at Hotter Than Hell that year. There are numerous paved roads around Manhattan that offer safe and scenic riding. The Wamigo Loop I mentioned consists of Old Military Trail Road, K99 Highway, Zendale Road, and US 24. My favorite loop is a loop made up of the state highways K13 and K16 along Carnahan Road, which is where my bovine buddy we just saw lives. <clears throat> now it's time to talk about gravel riding. The fastest growing aspect of cycling today is biking on gravel roads. And it just so happens we live in arguably the best gravel riding area in the country, the Flint Hills. Riders have turned to gravel roads as a way to get away from crowded highways filled with distracted drivers Aiding the move to gravel has been the development of better bikes and tires for use on gravel roads. The development of gravel racing is also a big, has had a big impact. Seen here is the Pony Express race uh, in Marysville, Kansas. The Dirty Kanza 200 in Emporia is the premier gravel race in the country. There are many fine sites to discover on the gravel roads around Manhattan, Kansas. Pictured here is the famous Shamrock Cafe, a favorite of cyclists and geocachers. Other nearby gyms include the Volan Store and the Breacher Bible and Rifle Church. The peace and serenity of the Flint Hills is unsurpassed. If you want to get away from people, the red-tailed hawks sitting on fence posts, the turkey vultures soaring on the breeze, the scampering coyotes, and of course the hundreds of cows curiously watching you ride by will all be happy to keep you company. For most folks, gravel roads are best enjoyed in the company of others. Find a friend and get started riding gravel by practicing on the Linear Park, Wildcat Creek Road, or the west section of Marlette Avenue. Then you can branch out to the Pleasant Valley Road, Pillsbury Crossing Road, Tallgrass Road, or Old K-18 pictured here. Nationally, mountain biking remains very popular, but true mountain biking is quite limited here in Kansas. Locally, the best mountain bike trails are at Fancy Creek State Park at the north end of Tuttle Creek Reservoir. However, and simply due to its proximity, the river trail on the southeast side of town is the most popular mountain biking trail in the area. 
That trail is located between the levee and the Kansas River. For those new to cycling, one of the best ways to get started is to try the many rides held through the month of May as part of Bike Month. There are a number of events designed to get new and experienced riders out pedaling. Pictured here is the women's ride, which has been held for several years now. This ride goes for about 20 miles and is beginner friendly. The Little Apple Pedal uses the linear park to get novice cyclists out riding. This event starts in the Village Plaza area and is quite popular with families. The Little Apple Pedal goes just a few miles, stops for some watermelon, and then returns to the original starting point. This May will be the fourth year for the Little Apple Pedal. And of course, there is a Bike Month gravel ride for beginners. As you can see, we had a nice group this past May. We went for about 15 miles exploring some of the roads I mentioned earlier, including Tallgrass Road, and we also stopped for snacks at the Shamrock Cafe. The most popular Bike Month ride, go figure, is the Progressive Dinner Ride. It starts with an appetizer somewhere in the Ville, pizza downtown at AJ's, and finishes at the ice, with ice cream at a nearby park. Another fun biking event occurs at Christmas time with the Mayor's Lighted Holiday Parade. There are always lots of bikes going from downtown to Aggieville. String up some lights on your bike, pull on your parka, and come join us this year. If I've not convinced you that there are plenty of places to ride in and around Manhattan, then I suppose you can try one of the many indoor spin classes available locally. Some people feel safer indoors with a bunch of sweaty people and unknown pathogens, but you won't run into me at one of these places. I believe cycling is an activity best enjoyed outdoors with fellow peddlers. Fresh air, the Kansas wind, the changing seasons, and our many fine parks and neighborhoods, and of course, the unparalleled Flint Hills await you and your friends. Get out there and have an adventure. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. All right, so our next speaker Moving right along is Kaylee Proctor. Hi, Kaylee. Kaylee Proctor is the owner of Little Apple Doulas, a doula agency in Manhattan, and is a certified labor and postpartum doula, childbirth educator, child passenger safety technician, and paramedic. Kaylee was a, born a natural leader, and her passion for supporting families through birth and postpartum began in 2011 and continues to expand to embrace different aspects of early parenthood. She resides in Manhattan with her husband, Wes, and their three children, and she enjoys playing softball in her spare time. Please welcome Kaylee. endorsed by Hasbro. I just needed that. <laughs> All right, I'm ready. My name's Kaylee Proctor and I know how to change the world. The secret to changing the world is inside each and every single one of us here in this room. It's very simple, not easy, but simple. It's contained within three letters and three pounds. And you don't even have to be educated to know how to do it. You don't have to be a doctor, a rocket scientist, a lawyer. You don't even have to be an adult. In fact, I'd argue that children are probably better equipped to do this than we are. But before I get into any details and secrets, I want to start with an anatomy and physiology lesson because I am a nerd uh, <laughs> at heart. So what I want to show you here is your brain. Um, your brain is approximately three pounds. It is the operating system for your entire body. It controls when you eat, when you breathe, what you think, and when you speak, some of us more than others. One other thing it's in charge of is hormone production and regulation. One of the hormones it helps us produce and regulate is the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin is produced in these four circumstances. 
Oxytocin is part of our parasympathetic nervous system, or what we can lovingly refer to it as feed and breed. It is the opposite of our sympathetic nervous system, which we may know as fight or flight, which is controlled by our stress hormones. Now, the one I want to focus on today is love and bonding. A fun fact is that we're not born knowing how to love. We learn how to do this by having our needs met. And when our needs are met, we develop trust. And when we trust people, we are connected and we love them. We develop more oxytocin. Yay, oxytocin, right? So what needs are we referring to? Dr. Maslow is a psychologist who developed the hierarchy of needs. It's shaped as a pyramid because the base is the foundation in which we exist. We need these physiological, biological needs met. We have to survive as a species. This includes food, drink, air, warmth, sleep, even sex, because we have to procreate, right? The next layer includes security in having those needs met. Maybe it's healthcare. Maybe it's a program that helps you fund um, housing for yourself. And the layer above that is security, or excuse me, connection. Connection amongst our peers, connection amongst our family, connection with our intimate partner. Yay, oxytocin again, right? So oxytocin is formulated, or excuse me, produced more once our needs are met to this layer. Now we can't produce, we can't uh, advance any further in this pyramid unless these needs are being met but we are dynamic beings, so we can have multiple layers of needs being met at the same time. We are not all or nothing. But once we have these needs met, we can advance to these higher levels, which include self-esteem and respect, self-development, um, and even in an expanded version of this includes things like transcendence, where we reach our full potential as human beings. But we can't do that if the base needs aren't met, right? Take a look at this woman. She looks like she's enjoying a conversation with her friends in a restaurant while they're drinking some tea. She's having potentially all of her needs met at the same time, depending on the topic of conversation. But I really think that this conversation, this picture would look much different if this woman just escaped from being lost in the woods for five days, struggling to eat or drink, right? It would probably do that to her pyramid. The base would come apart. Think of it as like the instrument panel in your car. All of these gauges don't need to be at full capacity every single minute of the day, but a well cared for vehicle will get you a long way. You could probably even get away from you know, fudging a few things for a while, but eventually it would go kaput. When we apply these things to children, particularly infants and toddlers and preschoolers, I like to reduce it down to one key question. What are the needs? Where do they come from? Who are they coming from? Because we're going to be connected to those people. How do they work and why? Why is the three letters that are so important in understanding how the world works, understanding one another, and developing compassion and empathy for our fellow humans. It allows us to increase production of oxytocin, which furthers our brain development and the neural pathways that are formed. Now, children are always getting their needs met by their caregivers, hopefully, yes? Our caregivers are so important, especially our parents. These are our first teachers in life. The early childhood years are so important in developing these neural pathways and teaching children how to thrive in the world that we live in. Now imagine this caregiver not getting her needs met. She's probably not going to be able to do a very good job of meeting her child's needs. You can't give any more from a cup that is empty, right? So what do we need to do to ensure that children's needs are met? We need to meet the needs of their caregivers. We are taking care of our future in our children. Now, apply this to different ways that parents may face trouble getting these needs met. Forms of oppression, uh, poverty, lack of access to health care, difficulty finding a job. If they're stuck in this cycle of stress and needing these, meeting the biological needs, these very core needs, it's going to be very difficult to progress beyond that. In fact, extreme neglect is linked to decreased brain development and increased issues with anxiety, depression, learning and memory issues. And when people don't learn how to connect to one another, they start to learn how to connect to things. They're looking for that next, that next easiest way to connect with something that gives them those field code hormones, hence our addiction problem today. 
What I've learned as a doula and as a caregiver for other people and other children is that when I'm taking good care of parents and I'm fulfilling the parents' needs, they're better able to meet the needs of their children. Their children are going to thrive when they're connected with their caregivers. So what if we started thinking about raising our children amongst our peers, our extended family members, our neighbors, and our friends? What if we started embracing this community aspect of it takes a village to raise a child? Instead of favoring isolationism and independence, what if we learn to lean on one another? What if we started thinking about this as we're embracing our future by taking care of one another, not just each other, but our other people's children? And it starts at birth. And when we take what we have, you don't have to know everything, but if you take what you have in any one given moment, what you know, what your skill set is, and you can apply it, we can change the world together. So I encourage you to be the village. Thank you, Kaylee. Our next presenter is Rita Ross. Rita Ross taught school for 30 years. She had never hiked more than a handful of miles at once when her husband, Fred Newton, dropped her off in the Appalachian Mountains of Georgia in the spring of 2013. Whoa, <laughs> I would be really mad at my husband. <laughs> as he <laughs> be like, come back and get me now. As he pulled away from the trailhead, leaving her alone among the trees and rocks and mountains, she asked herself, what have I done? <laughs> Rita didn't know anyone who had hiked long distances, but she was compelled to give it a go, intrigued by thoughts of solitude in nature and total responsibility for oneself. It turns out that this Kansan enjoys going up and down mountains all day. She has completed about half of the Appalachian Trail, a little over 1,100 miles, and she intends to keep going until she reaches the end of the trail, the summit of Mount Katahdin in Maine. Please welcome Rita. The Appalachian National, National Scenic Trail extends from Springer Mountain, Georgia to Mount Katahdin, Maine, a total of approximately 2,200 miles. Completed in 1937, the AT traverses 14 states, mostly through forests and wildlands. It is known to be the longest hiking-only trail in the world. This graph shows the elevation changes from Maine to Georgia. The highest point on the AT is Clingman's Dome in North Carolina. The elevation, elevation changes over the entire trail are equivalent to climbing Mount Everest 16 times. I average about 15 miles a day. Mileage varies depending on factors such as weather or terrain. The greatest number of miles I've covered in one day is 23, the least is zero. In places, the trail looks like these photos and the miles are easy. <laughs> in places, the trail looks like these photos and the going is slower, although the challenges are rewarding. It can rain so hard that it is difficult to see a few feet ahead of yourself and your fingers and toes become prunes. The trail can become a gutter of flowing water or an ice slide. The AT is marked by white blazes, two inches wide and six inches long. Although it is usually easy to know where you are on the trail, there are times when the path isn't obvious and no blaze is in sight. When you finally find a blaze, relief and gratitude are pretty huge. More than once I have thanked a blaze out loud as I passed by. 
you have to find and filter your own water on the trail. Little bridges like this can be found close to towns, but usually streams and mud puddles will meet your boots. Water becomes scarce in spots, especially in late summer. Some streams can be deep and swift, requiring careful crossing and wet clothing. This is an old well down in the corner in the middle of the woods. A little frog was swimming here one day when I got water. My three ounce stove fits into this little red canister. I make instant coffee every morning and cook a hot meal at night. Leave no traces practiced religiously on the AT. All trash is packed out. People who leave waste behind are not thought of kindly. Three-sided shelters are found periodically along the trail. I like to stay in or near them because they are usually close to a water source. Hikers tend to gather at shelters where stories are shared and information exchanged. It's also nice when you get a shelter all to yourself. Most shelters have privies nearby. These are composting privies and trash is not allowed. Some are nicer than others. Hand sanitizer is used liberally around privies and shelters. Every shelter has a broom and a dustpan. The first hiker to arrive for the night is expected to sweep out the shelter for the hikers who will be arriving later. There's also a log book where hikers leave notes. This page has notes from some of my friends the first year I hiked. AT hikers go by trail names which are bestowed by other hikers. They are truly our names when we are on the trail. It is becoming increasingly important to keep your food and other scented items such as toothpaste away from bears, mice, and other critters. Some shelters provide bear cables or a bear pole or a self-locking metal bear box for hikers to store their food. When there are no provisions for protecting food, you throw a line over a tree branch sufficiently high and far away from your tent or shelter. This is my hammock, which weighs two pounds. It's very quick to hang up and take down. It is cozy to climb into with my book and headlamp at the end of the day. It's especially good in the rain. This photo on the end was taken the morning after a storm that began with pea-sized hail. I stayed dry and warm, as did my gear, which was stashed in bags underneath. One of the best rewards of hiking up a mountain is a stunning view. When you're alone on a summit, you feel so small, and the sights are so vast. <laughs> Sometimes your eyes want to stay a while, but you have to push on. Hiker hostels vary from simple to sublime. The chance for a shower and a rest in a real bed are luxuries appreciated by most. You can take Uncle, Uncle Johnny's shuttle van for a ride to supper and a resupply. You can sit on Oma's screened porch for a home-cooked meal and a view of her mountain lake. You can bunk in Stanimal's basement hostel, and you can eat roasted spam on a stick at Standing Bear Farm. Trail Days is held in May. There are a hiker parade, booth speakers, an auction, a talent show, hand crocheted hats from the church ladies and celebrities. I met Jean Espy, the second person to hike the entire AT, and A. Wall Miller, who wrote a book about hiking the AT, as well as the definitive guide, the one I use for every mile. It's like meeting Mick Jagger. <laughs> After Trail Days in 2014, I got to participate in an event called Hardcore, where hikers work on the trail. I cleared a section of trail by myself and got to paint two white blazes. We replaced a long, steep, gullied section of trail with new switchbacks. We got to open the trail and see the first hiker and his dog enter. The Appalachian Trail Conservancy has a headquarters and visitor center in Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. Every hiker who intends to hike the entire AT in any number of years can register there and have a photo taken. In September of 2015, I was hiker number 444. There are surprises on the trail. There are ponies in the Grayson Highlands. A North Carolina town throws a hiker potluck every week. You get to hike through cows. One cold rainy night, a hiker named Hillbilly played his guitar and sang Jerry Garcia songs. Another time, a hiker stopped me to play a jazz song on his trumpet in the middle of the woods. Other surprises include a collapsing hiking pole, which I fixed with duct tape, and a mouse who gave birth in my pack. I also <laughs> forgot my spoon one time, so I made one from a rhod rhododendron branch, the lid to my fuel canister, and a hair tie. Hot supper, always. The parallels between a distance hike and the journey of life are many. Both are surprising, beautiful, thrilling, and difficult. As in life, each person's hike is their own. Hike your own hike is a saying on the trail, and it applies to life as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Rita. Okay, I'm going to do some technolo technological stuff. Let's see here. Uh, oh, there it is. Sorry. It's not on my screen. <laughs> Go to the left. Oh. And then what? Oh, all the way to the left. Oh, 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 I see. Thank you. Okay, part two. Got it. And open this. Let's see. Awesome. Okay. Our next speaker is Mickey Tobler. Mickey Tobler is a professional fish squeezer and studies evolution in extreme environments at K-State's Division of Biology. He spends his time trying to reverse engineer nature, mostly because understanding how organisms work gives him a sense of purpose and an appreciation for the beauty of our world. He, obs he obsesses over smoking the perfect pork barbecue, taking that picture of a sunrise, and seeing all 341 species of obscure fish in the live bearer family in their natural habitat. He is also grateful for his family and students that help him keep his obsessions in check. Mickey has recently found a band of kindred spirits in KSI, the Kansas Science Communication Initiative, a group of communicators, educators, and scientists that unabashedly flaunt their nerdiness to spread an appreciation for science and research. Please welcome Mickey. Hello, everybody. I guess I'm ready. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Mickey. Um, I'm a scientist. I work at K-State, and I spend most of my days figuring out how organisms work and where biodiversity comes about. And today, I hope just to instill one simple thought um, into your brains, and that is seeing the world through science is not only useful, it is actually beautiful, too, and, is, and it is fun. So have you ever thought... Um, what if there was life elsewhere in the universe? Have you ever thought what if there was life on Mars? How those organisms would look like? Have you ever thought how they would survive in these inhospitable conditions? Obviously, we don't know, right? Um, but you don't need a spaceship uh, to find extreme environments that seem inhospitable. Right here on Earth, we find environments that are so cold, so dry, so hot, and so deep that they obviously test the limits of life. But no matter how hostile uh, to life a particular environment appears to be, um, we always seem to be able to find some organisms that thrive there. A, fi a famous biologist once said, the history of evolution is that life escapes all barriers. Life breaks free. Life expands to new territories. Life finds a way. And it was not Charles Darwin. <laughs> so organisms in extreme environments have some pretty amazing adaptations. Some fish and shrimp living in, in the Antarctic oceans, they have antifreeze proteins in their blood. These, this prevents them from freezing even when their environment is below zero degrees Celsius. Understanding how organisms can manage to survive in extreme environments tells us, some, tells us something fundamental about evolution. Sometimes this knowledge leads to, to do important technological breakthroughs. For example, Understanding how microbes um, can live in these hot springs has led to DNA sequencing, the very technology that makes your personalized medicine possible today. So organisms in extreme environments lend themselves to find solutions to questions that philosophers and scientists have pondered for hundreds of years. How do organisms survive and how uh, does, do new species come about? In my lab, we are asking just these questions. We study these questions in a marvelous place, an underground lair that is perpetually dark and full of hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is a toxic gas that kills most forms of life in a matter of minutes. National Geographic has dubbed this cave a hell on earth. But while hydrogen sulfide is extremely toxic, it can also serve as an energy source for some microbes that grow like snot from the ceiling of the cave. These critters use hydrogen sulfide like plants use sunlight. These microbes provide a food source for an entire underground ecosystem. And it turns out that not only microbes live in hell, hell is teeming with life. 
There are thousands of bats, there are spiders the size of your face, and there are myriads of insects. And most prominently, there are these small fish called cave mollies that occur in incredible densities. They swim there, never seeing light, always exposed to the toxic water. So how do they do it? Now, it turns out cave mollies have no fundamentally novel traits. They have the same building blocks as other fish that live in normal streams. Nonetheless, they have modified some of their traits in unique ways. They're losing their eyes and pigment. They have modified genes that help them to detoxify the hydrogen sulfide. And they, as they have adapted to the extreme environment, they have lost the ability to breed with similar fish that live just outside of the cave. As cave mollies are modifying their traits uh, to tolerate the extreme environment, they're also evolving into new species. Adaptation directly leads to new biodiversity. We have learned all of this about cave mollies through reverse engineering. We spend our time deconstructing uh, the fish into their composite pieces to reveal how they actually work. If you think of natural selection as a blind watchmaker crafting biodiversity, we're essentially taking apart the clockwork to figure out what makes it tick. And so as the watchmakers work, work clearly has a purpose, it's also beautiful. And I think of science the same way. It's often useful, but understanding how things work is also beautiful. And so it turns out rocket scientists that watch a spaceship go into um, um, in the air, they don't say, well, check it out, our equations worked again. They say, wow, this is awesome, this is beautiful, right? So why doesn't everybody see it that way? Why do science and scientists often have a bad rep? Might have to do with how some science scientists uh, or the way scientists are often um, um, portrayed. Seriously, um, we're not all white, we're not all men, right? We're not all wearing lab coats. And so I think we're all born as natural scientists. And this is my daughter, she loves bugs. We have no clue why, but it turns out a lot of kids are that way. And then <laughs> eventually they lose the interest. Why? Is it because uh, they're told their interests are yucky or not cool? Or has it maybe to do with the fact that they might not be able to see uh, or to have uh, role models that they can look up to? And so I'm part of the Kansas Science Communication Initiative. We're scientists, communicators, educators that believe that science has an important uh, play, uh, role to play in all of our lives. We work to engage communities in understanding, promoting, and particip participating in science and research. We work with scientists to help them be accessible nerds and role models. Becoming a scientist means that you'll learn a specialized language that makes us very efficient in communicating with one another. But it also means that we often lose the ability to convey important ideas um, in an accessible manner. And so we're helping scientists to talk like normal people again. We're also working to provide additional opportunities for the public and scientists to interact. So have you been to a Science on Tap, Science Saturday at the zoo? Uh, go visit, it's a great opportunity to actually meet um, with some of these nerds. And at the end, a simple pitch, K-State Science Communication Week is from November 5 to 10, with events at K-State, at the Sunset Zoo, the Flint Hills Discovery Center, and other places. Check out our website for the different events. We'd love to see you there and talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mickey. Our final speaker for the evening is Jared Tremblay. Jared joined the Flint Hills Metropolitan Planning Organization in July of 2016. Prior to this, he worked for the City of Manhattan Public Works Department as the Infrastructure Analyst for Water and Sewer Modeling. He also served as the staff liaison to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, working towards increasing, increasing safety and facilities for cyclists and pedestrians. He began his career working in Kansas City for a private GIS firm specializing in satellite imagery analysis and pipeline mapping. Jared and his wife moved back to Manhattan to raise their daughter, Opal. His passion for creating a multimodal transportation system is evident in his personal choices and the com in community habits. Most of the time, you will see Jared walking or biking to meetings, leaving his vehicle at home. Please welcome Jared. Good evening. I'm going to compliment what Mr. Colburn talked about earlier with cycling. We're going to jump around a little bit, so let's do it. 
So who cares about bikes and pedestrians, also known as people who walk? A lot of people do, of course, and so should you. And why is that? Because bikes and pedestrians take up less space than vehicles to get around. And space, as we will soon see, has meaning to us all. So here you can see the space it takes to move 69 people in four different modes of transportation, walking, busing, biking, and uh, by vehicle. And so here we go. Space equals money. The table below gives the approximate space to hold each of those 69 people. Further, you can see the cost in concrete to build enough infrastructure to hold those people. About $1,200 for peds and about $58,000 for vehicles. It's quite a stark reality. And that's just the start. This does not include the amount of money for property, right-of-way, and so on. So what if I told you, you weren't stuck in traffic, you are traffic. We all complain about cars on the road, but we never think we're part of the problem. And the cartoon on the left is, shows the law of induced demand. If we could build enough lanes to build our way out of traffic, don't you think Atlanta, Los Angeles, and Beijing would have figured that out by now? Here in Manhattan, vehicles are not always the most efficient way to get around. Using real-time data, Google puts out these, these uh, directions. You can see to go from Jardine to Walmart is oftentimes faster to go via a bicycle than it is by a car, and it is always more pleasant. But you can't go everywhere easily in Manhattan by bike. Dr. Wesh at Anthropology put this together. It's the archipelago map of Manhattan. Our highways have created de facto walls for bikes and pedestrians. And we have very few safe and direct connections between these islands. Crossing Tuttle Creek Boulevard on foot or bike is not a fun thing to do, I assure you. So what has been our solution till now? One, bike boulevards. I'm sure you've all seen these. Bike boulevards are on-street routes that are marked by the white sharrows that you can see circled in red. These are on street routes, they are on low traffic, they're direct and low speed uh, traffic as well. And they also have the wayfinding signage on the right. They're a good way to get around town. Also, we have bike, bike lanes. Everyone is familiar with these. These are pretty standard. These are also on the street. It is a separate place for, for bicyclists to ride, uh, supposed to be away from the vehicles. It doesn't always happen. But again, these, uh, these are just separated by painted white lines. Not the safest thing in the world. And trails. We, all, we have the trail prioriza prioritization project going around. Trails, of course, are generally off street. They're separated. They're safe. This is the only place in Manhattan where my seven-year-old daughter and wife and I can ride our bicycles together. So, <laughs> so what have we done since 2011? Here you can see a chart. Bike boulevards in green, bike lanes in blue, and trails in purple. There's two maps to give you a comparison of what we've done. We've nearly doubled our bicycling infrastructure from 40 miles to 73. However, is this good enough? And I would argue absolutely not. We need AAA, which stands for All Ages and Abilities, also known as 8 to 80. Why do we need this, you ask? Because research shows that women, children, elderly, and novices do not use bike boulevards and bike lanes, so they ride on the sidewalks or not at all. Get these groups cycling and everyone wins. We use less space. So what is AAA? These are examples. Here you can see a protected bike lane. This is actually Evanston, uh, Illinois, right next to Northwestern University. They're separate facilities. They have safe crossings and protected bike lanes. Um, does it work? Everywhere they've been built, they've worked. There's no reason why they wouldn't here. They're even built in Lincoln, Nebraska. So. Here are two examples in the United States. The one at the top right is called a protected intersection. You can see the green uh, protected bike lanes that lead to it, and then you have the concrete islands that protect it. This is a classic Dutch design that has been adopted, adapted to the United States. And then on the bottom, unfortunately, there's vehicles on it, but this used to be a road. It's on campus. It's now for vehicles. So even more exciting is the opportunity to do something truly great in Manhattan. Again, there's that picture. What we'd like to do someday uh, is to really work on North Manhattan Avenue. Currently, there are 400 bikes and, and 2,000 pedestrians that cross Anderson Avenue every day on North Manhattan Avenue. We can make it better. So here we go. Manhattan is growing, so we have more cars, so we have more traffic, which means we need wider roads, but those take more money and space, which we don't have. So we need to make our existing roads use better. That means creating options for drivers, bikes, buses, and peds. For bikes, that means those AAA facilities, so that a portion of those drivers become cyclists, which means less traffic, which means less, uh, which means our current roads are okay, which means we have less money to spend and don't have to widen the roads. Now to something completely different. Safe routes to school. In 1969, 48% of children walked to school and the obesity rate was 5%. 
In 2015, 13% of children walked to school, and the obesity rate is 17%. So Safe Routes to School is a federal program to, dish, to make it better for children to bike and walk to school. This, this cartoon says it all right here. It says, there is too much traffic for Billy to walk to school, so we drive him. <laughs> Therein lies the problem. We know the right thing to do, but we've built an environment where we can't do it, so we do the wrong thing, in this case, driving. Unfortunately, Manhattan is not immune to this. This map shows uh, school attendance zones. The stars are schools. Here you can see that we have children in Redbud that attend school at Bergman Elementary on the northwest side of town. Likewise, we have children at Lee that live in Northview. How is a child ever going to walk that? No wonder we don't have too many. However, we have some great things going on. Uh, bikes cut distances as you can go further faster. So working with USD, uh, we were able to get a grant called the Bicycle Safety and Awareness Program. It kicks off this month. Every fifth and sixth grader will take a three-week course as part of their uh, PE courses. Our goal is to have better cyclists and safer drivers someday. Green Apple Bikes, here we go. They are not city-owned. They are a private organization. Um, you see them all over town. I see them all over town, but it turns out only one in 20 bikes that we count annually is a Green Apple bike. But the one bike we did put a GPS tracker on, it traveled 143 miles in 30 days. That's with driving removed. So what if all 350 Green Apple bikes travel 140 miles uh, a month? That's a lot of traffic off our roads. Imagine if they were driving. And last, I'd just like to ask, what if you made one trip by bike, by bus, or by foot each week or day? What that would do for us in our long-term needs for space and funding. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. So that concludes the presentations. And so we will now open up the mic for questions for our presenters. But we're gonna give them a quick moment to uh, move their chairs to face all of you. All right, and so how this is gonna work is you get to just walk up to that microphone over there and ask your question to anybody. Anybody that you want. So we'll leave that time for questions. Hi, I have a question. Um, my name's Molly. I'm a senior at K-State, and I'm in um, biology and medical biochem. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the science communication initiatives that kind of go on throughout the year. So I know that there's science on tap, and... Um, at Redina's, there's something on Tuesdays. Yep. Can you talk about that a little bit? So, yeah, great question. So, the, what you're referring to at Redina's once, once a month as Science Cafe um, that's organized uh, by a handful of faculty members um, at K-State uh, and pulls largely from, from, I believe, faculty at K-State to talk about their research. Um, Science on Tap is a monthly event that is mostly sponsored by, um, by Sunset Zoo. And Sunset Zoo mostly relies um, on people that went through their Science Communication Fellowship program. So it turns out that they're actually mostly graduate students that present at, at Science on Tap. Um, and they all received some sort of training that hopefully helps them, as I said, to talk like normal people. Um, in the winter month, so those those things both go on primarily during the, the, the school year, uh, once a month. During the winter months, uh, Sunset Zoo has um, the Science Saturday um, events. Those are mostly targeted at family audiences. Again, it's mostly um, the Science Communication Fellows that present hands-on ac activities there. And then KSI in general um, is active also mostly throughout the school year. So if you go to kstate.edu slash SciCom, um, there's an entire calendar of events um, ranging from kind of pro professional development opportunities for undergraduate students, graduate students, and, and faculty members and staff. Um, there's a um, Science Communication Week um, that has both training through workshops and has like outfacing events um, that um, can be attended by the public audience. And so that's kind of a hodgepodge of events um, throughout the year. Um, am I forgetting something? Daniel, 
Yeah, I guess one of the big events uh, this year during Science Communication Week is the Food Explorer um, events. Um, this uh, celebrates kind of the, uh, the publication of a book. Uh, it's a biography of a former son of a K-State president that traveled the world and introduced, I think, over 100 new fruits and vegetables to the diets of Americans, like the avocado and whatnot. So there's a series of events planned around that. And I think there's an event here at the public library, too, associated with that. There you go. <laughs> I hope uh, that that answered it. But so the, the case I website is really where, where all the info is. Hope, hopefully that was not too long-winded. <laughs> this has been so fascinating. Thank all of you for your wonderful presentation. My question is for Mrs. Ross. When, when preparing for the Appalachian Trail, how did, you, how did you do that physically and mentally? Did you read a lot of books? Did you do a lot of hiking around here? Did you use the, the, uh, the linear trail system? Or did you go to Colorado and start hiking? <laughs> Just tell us a little bit about that, and I'll sit down. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did read a lot of books. Uh, I wasn't even sure I wanted to do the hike until I read uh, the book by AWOL, David AWOL Miller. Uh, which just described his hike, and I'm like, yeah, I got to do that. So that that helped me. That made me mentally prepared. I didn't do anything really physically. I just jumped right in and kind of built up to it little by little. Uh, but I don't know, worked. <laughs> uh, hi, Jared. I I feel ashamed because I drove here. Uh, <laughs> As did I. Yeah. <laughs> I feel, trust me, it, yeah. guilt every time I get in right. a vehicle. Yeah. Someone stole my bike, so it's justified. But, uh, well, the, the question I have um, was kind of getting your explication on the theoretical underpinning you talk about, the law of induced demand. Yeah. And I'm wondering if there's any parallels to Jay Forrester's counterintuitive behavior social systems or Jevons' paradox where increased technology buzzwords mean increased energy use. I guess I just want to know, like, the mental metal behind the pedal. Huh. Well, I'm not fit to answer that question, um, but it, it, there's a lot of research out there that does show that when you make driving cheap, free, and easy, cheap gas, people will drive more. There's been tons of studies, not studies, real life incidents where people have closed roads down, major interstates, and lo and behold, people still make it to work, to the grocery store, and so on. They change their habits maybe a little bit. It's maybe a little bit more inconvenient. But what's an extra five minutes when you're already spending 30? Likewise, when they've reopened or expanded uh, freeways, Los Angeles just spent $1.6 billion a few years ago. What's happened? It's, it's completely full of traffic, again, on that very same intersection. It did nothing except create more cars in the same space. So that's really just the law of induced demand. If it's there, if you build it, they will come sort of mentality. I had a question for Jared. Uh, you talked about how um, getting more people on uh, using our sidewalks and getting on bicycles will take cars off the road. Can you also tell us more about uh, the personal benefits of walking and biking? Well, Thanks. of course, it's healthy. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that when I drive my vehicle home at the end of the day, I'm a different person when I walk through the door than by the time I've de-stressed and gotten some energy out. I can tell you when I walk or bike my daughter to school, she has a better day when we do that. She's had some extra exercise. Research so shows that exercise helps with focus uh, as well as your mental state of being. And so... Um, quite honestly, just by creating these facilities, we're not going to get people to transition over. If you're going across town, that's, that's really not our goal. Our goal is not to make someone go from Grand Mere to Walmart, take their bicycle. That's, that's a hell of a journey. Our goal is to make someone going from, from Jardine to Aggieville not take their car. If we could get a fraction of people making unnecessary short trips from what I would call laziness, that clears the road up for everyone else that does need uh, the space. And so obviously there's a ton of benefits there. Exercise, mental health, all these things are tied together. I didn't have time to go into any of them, um, but that's really it. And I would uh, just also like to point out that uh, we don't want people riding on the sidewalks. In fact, we have quite a, quite a conversation regularly about it. At K-State, where do you ride your bicycle? 
You ride it on the sidewalks and the wide paths they create. When you cross Anderson Avenue in Aggieville, it is against the law to ride your bike on that same sidewalk. So there's a lot of mixed messaging as well. My question is for Dave. Dave, I'm interested in getting started with biking, but I have no endurance and I find the seat very uncomfortable. So what <laughs> tips do you have for beginners? Uh, stand up while you pedal. Um, <laughs> Uh, our rear ends are like any other muscle in our body. It takes a little bit of development. Uh, everybody that gets started cycling for the first time experiences a little bit of discomfort. Um, but, uh, you know, the seat that comes on your bicycle is not, is not welded on there. And if it's not comfortable, you can get a different seat. Um, we have a way of measuring your sit bones at my shop where we can match up your seat to a to the proper your seat to a bike seat and make it more comfortable. Um, you know, for short ride, distance riding, it's not particularly practical, but for long distance cycling, uh, we all wear uh, padded bike shorts. And it's um, not so much about the padding per se, but it's about moisture management. Um, there's a lot of, you know, cycling's a sport of repetition, a lot of up and down and up and down and and so uh, bike shorts are designed to manage the moisture and prevent chafing and, and allow you to sit on a bike for a long time and, and actually be comfortable. Um, and endurance just has to come with, uh, with uh, practice. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. How do you do the Hutter and Hell 100? Practice, practice, practice. So, um, but it's, it's easy. Just get on a bike and go for a little while and just keep working at it and you'll get there. So one of the easiest ways that we seek that connection is in the palm of our hands with our smartphones. We can get on social media and very easily connect with our friends that live across the country or our family members. And just by chatting with them, we feel like we've satisfied that need for connection. And that's one way we can connect. And it's, and it's a great way that we can utilize technology to our advantage. But I think it's important to know that we can't replace human connection with technology because that skin-to-skin -to -skin touch, that interaction face-to-face, -face, and that kind of belonging that you feel when you're with your friends is really important, not only for you, but for your children to connect with their children. And we used to live in like this tribe village mentality, and we've gotten away from that here, but other cultures still do it. And just living amongst your family. If you're not living amongst your family, creating a group of friends, maybe meeting them through a mom's group, or you know, a, a play date with other moms in the community where you can start to make those mom friends. And if you guys are doing similar things, or you're interested in similar things, then you guys can be hanging out and chatting while your little ones are playing. And let me tell you, it's a lot easier to take care of them when they're keeping each other busy. <laughs> because when you're the only one home with them, you're, you feel like you have to be everything for them. And it's impossible to be everything for everyone. But if you can stick to your zone of genius, like say you really love teaching them numbers and letters and you want to sit down and do those activities with them, great. But if you really hate playing outside because you want to just be inside doing your things that you feel like you need to get done during the day, maybe connecting with your neighbors and one neighbor's outside monitoring all the kids playing and then you guys can kind of trade off or you can hang out in the driveway and just chit chat with one another while the kids are riding their bikes up and down the street. Hey, look, I talked about bikes like everyone else. <laughs> Full circle. <laughs> but uh, I hope that answers your question. But that's how I found like little ways to do it um, in, in not making such a drastic change, like picking up and moving into tiny house community living. Um, but like that's an idea too. <laughs> Hi, my name is Dylan. Uh, my question is for Dave. So 
Um, you talked a lot about organized cycling events that happen around Manhattan, and I love riding my bike. I have a gravel bike that I ride every day, but I never hear about these events until the day that they happen, right after they happen. So how do you keep track of all these things that are going on? Where do you go to keep track of these? The, the best is, do you do Facebook? So um, there's a Facebook group called Bike MHK Group Rides, and just ask to join, and you can join up. And that's, that's the best way to see uh, the group rides. They get posted there. Um, the weekly, there, there are rides that happen every week. Um, Saturday is the breakfast ride. Monday night, there's a road ride. Tuesday night, there's a really fast road ride. Wednesday night, there's a gravel ride. Friday night, there's usually a mountain bike ride. And those all get mentioned on, talked about on the Facebook page. Um, but you can also, when you join there, you can get on to the email list because sometimes the weather changes or, you know, something happens and the ride is canceled or moved or changed. And so being on both the Facebook page and the um, uh, email list is, is the best way. Um, and that's the most comprehensive source of finding organized rides. Um, we have that same information on a board at, in the, inside the Pathfinder. Um, there are other there are other rides that happen, but but that's that's the best single source. So it's bike MHK um, group rides, and that'll tap you into um, all the organized ones. And then you have, the other thing you'll see on there is every once in a while somebody says, "I want to go further than Wamigo, or I don't want to go that far. I'm going to start riding from City Park at five o'clock. Who wants to join me?" And so some rides happen that way. Is that is that a help? My question is for the lady that hikes the Appalachian Trail. Um, how many pairs of shoes have you gone through? <laughs> because I remember when our, when, our, when our first was a little, we hiked from Cades Cove up to the trail and back down when we visited the Smokies, and I wore out a pair of shoes and I lost half of my toenails, basically, from hiking down. But um, just was curious about that because it, it's just amazing undertaking. and. Yeah. How many miles was that? Well, that was it was <laughs> it was six miles up and six miles down. Wow! <laughs> and we were we were just like our yeah. bodies were, like we were out trip. of shape. Our bodies were dead the next day. And my husband had carried my son on his back virtually the whole way. So, yeah. yeah. But anyway. Well, um, I wore out one pair of shoes after about 500 miles, and then a second pair of shoes I traded in because I didn't like them. So, I so I'm still on the the replacement. So I'm on my third pair of shoes right now, but they're they're usually good for about 500 miles. And what kind of shoes are they? <laughs> my favorite are Oboes. I don't and they're they're just great. They're real sturdy and have a real nice inso insole. Um, but yeah, I lose toenails and get blisters too. You can't avoid it. <laughs> if there's a pathfinder, right? <laughs> Actually, Dave helped me a lot. He told me what kind of socks to get, but I still got blisters. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lost my voice, but um, my question is for Mrs. Ross also. Okay. I was in your class. Um, wow, way to go. <laughs> you grew up. Yeah. Hi, Chance. 20 years. <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us what your trail name is oh, God. <laughs> and if there's uh, any rhyme or reason to telling other people what their trail names is? What's, how's that work? All different ways. Some people give themselves their trail names, but that's sort of like not, that doesn't count. So my, I, okay, I'm Kansas, right? I, here I am, dumped in the Appalachian Mountains, and I'm, I find the trail, off I go. My first day, my first real day, I'm three miles in, and I, like, Three miles, I think I need a Snickers. Right, so I said, take a break, I'm eating my candy bar. And these trail workers, trail maintenance people come by, and they're like, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, so far, so good. They're like, you have a trail name yet? And I'm like, no, not yet. And they're like, 
how about so far so good? So <laughs> three miles in, I got my name. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm so far for short. <laughs> so there's that. And then um, early, my very first day, I met a young woman from uh, Germany who was celebrating her, she just completed her um, undergrad degree in biochemistry. And she was um, getting ready to go to grad school, but this was like her reward, right? She was going to hike the whole AT at once. And I guess there's like a movie in Germany that they show a lot because a lot of people from Germany like to come hike the Appalachian Trail. So um, so I told her, you know, she, you need a trail name. And I was determined we were going to find her a trail name. So um, I got to name her. I named her Raven. She reminded me of a Raven, and she liked that name, so she became Raven. But um, they, you really do forget. You call each other completely by trail names out there. You know, you don't even know what your real name is anymore. <laughs> Since we're on Rita Ross, I'm Fred Newton. The, the guy dumped her in Georgia. And <laughs> said so. But uh, I'm also the guy who came home and then. Occasionally at night, I might get a phone call if she has a signal back there. But would you tell them about some of the phone calls I got, like the time that a black bear jumped out of the tree? <laughs> or how about the worst time, which was the year that you called late in the afternoon and said, help, I'm sitting on the side of this trail and my leg's broken. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. There are some challenges. I wonder if yeah. you might mention those. Well... <laughs> Briefly, I did break my leg on the Appalachian Trail, but, but I was saved. The trail always provides, and a wonderful guy who knew the woods really well happened by and helped me get out, and now we're friends. So, Anyway, um, yeah, there are lots of animals on the trail, and there are black bears, thank goodness. There are no grizzlies. Um, and lots of snakes and deer and, and porcupines and all kinds of animals, so... You see a lot of wildlife. Uh, hi, my name is Rowan. Uh, this is for Dave or really anyone on the board. Uh, my parents love to bike. Sometimes they'll disappear for weekends and I'll come home on Monday and they'll be back. Um, but what's a good like Christmas gift for them? Because you know sometimes I draw blanks. <laughs> wow. <clears throat> it's September. I'm not thinking Christmas yet. Uh, <laughs> Well, um, there's, if they're doing long-distance cycling, uh, you, you constantly, almost everybody wears gloves, and you love having gloves of different colors so they can match your outfit, or just having plenty around because you left one pair somewhere and you can't figure out where it is and you need a pair. Same thing with uh, shorts. Um, if you can figure out their size, a, another pair of bike shorts is always a welcome thing because maybe you forgot to wash them last night and you want to go for a ride. And so you can never have enough pairs of sh bike shorts. Um, the uh, blinky light technology just continues to improve. And getting them, if they don't have or if they've got some older, um, uh, you know, flashing lights uh, for daytime visibility or for nighttime riding, you can't hardly miss miss with those. Um, those are the things that, that pop into my head. Good socks, um, just like with Rita and hiking. Really good socks, for me anyway, are critical, and you can't beat uh, good merino wool socks, and you can never have enough pairs of merino wool socks. Um, so those are the things that pop into my head. You're all, always welcome to come by the shop, and we can ponder some more. <laughs> Hi, my name is Barb, and I work at Consa Prairie, and my question is for Mickey. I know in your intro, I know you're a fish guy, right? It says you like, I don't know what all you do with fish, but how did you get into fish and tell us about some fish, tell us some fish stories or something, I don't know. Um, so how did I get into fish? When I was seven years old, um, my grandma moved from a house into an apartment, and I had a bicycle with a little trailer behind, and my job on summer vacation was to move her all of her stuff that she had accumulated for, I swear, 65 years from this giant house into this tiny apartment. And what I wanted to have in reward was this 
and they, they were really popular in the 90s in Europe. I don't know. There were these like giant bowls uh, with rocks that, that you could like put plants on it, and I just thought that was cool. Um, but I got a second-hand fish tank instead. <laughs> and then within a few years, I probably had like 20 of them or 30, and um, now I have like 450 <laughs> on campus. <laughs> so I have students that do the water changes now, so I got a little out of hand, I guess. But this, so that's how I got into it, and I just somehow, you know, I. I connected with the fish. Um, uh, they're just fascinating, you know. They, they are. They're not just colorful. They have all these amazing behaviors and these amazing adaptations. And even as a kid, I was just always stunned. You know, the the best thing I remember as a kid was when I I got these cichlids. They're really vicious and mean. They literally kill each other if you don't give them enough space. But if you just do it right, they raise their babies and they care, take care of their baby, baby for like six weeks. And so there's all these amazing behaviors and I just got funneled into. And that, then I went to college and I thought I was going to be a plant biologist because there was not really anyone studying fish where I studied. And then like the semester that I had to choose you know, a project, some guy from Germany moved to Zurich and said, well, I study fish. And I was like, all right, so I guess I'll work with you. So, <laughs> so it was all kind of totally haphazard. Um, but uh, uh, no regrets. Fish are the best. Um, <laughs> and snakes. I like snakes too. But <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? I have one more, sorry. No, that's okay. I was wanting to... Um, I was wondering, you saw all these great pictures of bike infrastructure, mm -hmm. and I was wondering, what do you think are the barriers to to getting that? They looked awesome, and I'd be like, I want that here, but what what's in the way of that happening here? Huh. Well, that's easy. Money. <laughs> um, no, it, it is. It's, it's, it's money uh, for the upfront capital investment. Um, it's willpower, both political and citizenry, you know, wanting this and advocating for it, because... Uh, as I mentioned, where we need it most around campus, Aggieville, the wards, you know, the roads are already up against the right of way in many locations. So, what's going to give? It's a lane of traffic, um, and so that's really the the give and take of it. And so, I'm not thinking it's going to be done tomorrow or next year, but at some point, our community, if we continue to grow, is going to have the decision of: Are we going to take away historic homes and widen our roads and take down our trees and spend more money? Or can we think about moving people differently? And so that's that's what it will take is money and political will, and and the public to say that we can do it a different way. Um, yeah. Any more questions? Final questions. Excellent. Well, on behalf of the Talk 20 MHK Committee from UFM and the Manhattan Public Library, thank you so much, all of you, for attending. We hope you enjoyed the event and will consider presenting in March. Presentation suggestions and proposals are open now on the website talk20mhk.org. Let's give our presenters one last big round of applause. Please feel free to stay a while, grab a snack, and stick around for some conversations. Reminder, the library will close at 9 p.m. Thank you all for coming.